Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, as always, is my co-host, though, Bishop. And we're going to talk about Europe a little bit this week. There's uh, a lot going on there in terms of elections and the usual shenanigans you would expect from the European ruling class. So we'll, we'll talk about a few of those issues. Uh, first, I just want to make sure and mention that uh, you get your copy of What Has Government Done to Our Money, the classic text from Rothbard, and we're giving away 100,000 of those. A bunch are gone already. But you Flying can, off the shelves, uh, right? Flying uh, off the shelves. Yes, very popular. And, uh, but we've still got tens of thousands left. So you can you can pick those up at Mises.org slash Rothpod free. Mises.org slash Rothpod free. If you got any questions about what is money, what is gold money, um, should we return to a gold standard, what causes inflation, what causes recessions, all that sort of stuff. That's all in that book. And uh, it's a quick read, too. It's a short book. So uh, pick up your copy. You can pick up multiple copies as well. All right. Well, let's talk about Europe a little bit. Uh, this has been something that uh, we've had to mention, uh, been planning to mention for the last couple of weeks just because they had some European Parliament elections there. Now, the European Parliament is not uh, the each country's uh, domestic legislature. So, right, Germany has its own legislature. France has its own legislature. They have different names. Uh, but there is also the European Parliament, which has hundreds of members and they have their own separate elections in many cases to send people to the to the European Parliament to to represent those countries' views, much the way that Congress works in the United States to some extent. Similar, certainly not exactly the same, but there's some similarities there. And uh, there's also the same interplay with political parties. If your party does very poorly in the European elections, that might suggest that your party is in decline domestically as well. Uh, for for the time being. And that was the big news uh, this past week, was the fact that uh, Emmanuel Macron's party, the Renew Party or Renaissance Party, whatever you want to call it, did very poorly uh, in the European Parliament election, so poorly that this caused Macron to uh, call for a snap legislative election. Uh, in an attempt to, I suppose, maybe retrench uh, for his party. And uh, this was covered very much in the news and really signaled, uh, the interpretation was, and this really signals a weakness with Macron's overall agenda. And so the way this was all framed, though, of course, in the media was far right parties doing well in Europe, because he had some similar trends also in Germany and several other countries that showed that there was a, uh, a resurgence, I don't know, a surge in uh, support for the quote-unquote far-right parties. Now, when they say far-right, of course, you, you should know this shtick by now, right? This is how the media works, right? When they say far-right, what they mean is basically what normal people were saying 20 years ago. Uh, they, these are people who don't want totally unlimited uh, immigration. And keep in mind, there's, there, this isn't like people moving and participating in the economy and help building up the economy. This is people, they move and then they immediately go on welfare. Uh, like in America, immigration is heavily, heavily subsidized in in Europe. And what it really is, is a government funded game where we try to bring a lot of people to the country. We immediately start funneling them government housing, government money, uh, and variety of government favors. Uh, and people don't like that. But this is all framed, of course, as xenophobia and everything like that. But people maybe are sick of uh, paying huge amounts of funds into the tax system to then see all that money go uh, to people who have never actually contributed to the country anyway because they just arrived. And so there's been a lot of opposition to that in Europe. And this, of course, is then labeled far right. Uh, also, there have been some concerns and issues about uh, some sort of local control, local, what we might call in this country, local sovereignty, I suppose. Uh, just the fact that maybe Belgians should be able to determine laws for Belgians, especially these are especially issues in Eastern Europe, Poland, uh, Hungary, where the rich countries of the European 
uh, union have been uh, basically dictating to the lower income Eastern European countries as far as what their immigration policies can be. Uh, and even and not even stopping there, uh, basically saying that when whenever the polls elect, quote unquote, the wrong people, the European elites declare that Poland is is no no longer democratic or they don't know how to do democracy right. And and the European elites, usually French and Germans, need to step in and tell Poland what's what. Uh, this, of course, is just this has been going on for 300 years uh, in Europe with the Germans trying to, to push around the Poles and the French trying to push around all their neighbors. Uh, that's just the same thing now as, uh, as now done democratically through the European Union. So the fact now that some of these countries are trying to assert some local independence, some local sovereignty is seen as far right. And then anyone that's even just like slightly right of center, like um, Georgia Maloney out of... Uh, out of Italy, this is declared uh, to be far right as well. And you'll remember back when she was running for uh, PM in Italy, uh, we were told, oh, how far right she is because uh, she has some reservations about totally unlimited immigration. Uh, but of course, that's not that's not what turned out at all. Point to me what's been going on in Italy that is far right. Maloney, she always talked a good game. Sounded really good in interviews, but boy, if you fell for that routine, uh, I guess you'll fall for anything, um, because Maloney unfolded just exactly as we expected her to, basically a slightly center-right politician doing exactly what the European Union would consider to be acceptable behavior. Uh, what else is going on? Well, Germany, the Alternative for Germany Party, AFD, doing quite well as... as uh, as shown in a lot of the headlines as well. And now you've even got some German green politicians saying, oh, we have to ban the party because uh, they are, uh, they're a danger to Germany. Uh, the Germans, of course, haven't learned anything in 80 years. It's still, they still love censorship, still love uh, you know, crushing opposition parties, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. Uh, but uh, also there's stuff going on in the United Kingdom. Uh, they've got an election coming up on, on July 4th. And I just wanted to set out what's going on in Europe here to really sort of set the tone and the context showing that a lot of the same issues uh, that are prevalent for the Europeans on the continent are there's some similarities there with what's going on for the Brits in the United Kingdom as well. So, though, let's uh, tell me what I need to know about the United Kingdom and uh, if there's some different issues there. Because, of course, this was the first European Parliament election since uh, Brexit, since the British finally actually left the uh, European Parliament. And so what's going on there? What are the issues? I, I know that the Conservatives, of course, have been the ruling party for a while. And uh, are things going to change there? Uh, are there are there quote unquote far right parties in the UK that now look poised to gain ground? Um, get me up to date. Right, and, and kind of as you alluded to, the, the label of far right in this case is largely being used as non traditional quote unquote conservative parties. So you know, you know most of these bodies, right? You know, there, there's been an establishment center right party. You know, similar to you know Bush era conservatism, right? You know, for example, in France, you had the Republicans. This was the, you know the party of Sarkozy and things like that. You know, these these parties are losing seats, or we're, you know have been, you've lost seats this election for the most part in many of these nations. And you had these these more populist, um, you know, outside parties um, such as Le Pen's uh, National Front Party. Um, and you know, we can you know there, there's there's some some issues there. I mean, particularly on economic issues with some of these parties, that is, is worth worth noting. Um, but it's what I, I think the the relevance though is that these are are voter revolts against the establishment. And there's also a very important, I think, generational dynamic, and I, I think this is really on on a, a very flamboyant display right now in the UK with the meteoric rise right now of the Reform Party there. Um, led by the very charismatic uh, Nigel Farage, who has obviously been, you know, a, a, I mean, very, very fascinating how an outside, um, you know, relatively fringe candidate, I mean, he is, he is the defining British politician, I, you know, I think you could safely say over the last decade, um, and Nigel Farage there. And, and, you know, I think some of the stuff that's, that's interesting, if you look at what are the issues that played very heavily according to polling, and, you know, take that for what it's worth, but, you know, I, I think it trends with, data that we have seen, trends that we have seen for quite some time, 
is that you know it's concerns over economic stagnation, it's concerns over government subsidized migration, and it is concerns with war um, and the, the ramifications of what is going on in Ukraine. And so you know there's there is this you know if you look at a lot of the trends with younger voters in Europe, I think that is one of the most fascinating stories about it because you know you had um, you know there has been this move to to lower the voting age. And the expectation there, right, was that this was going to continue to build and build and build a reliable left-wing coalition. And yet it is these younger voters that are really feeling the stress of the economic stagnation, um, the greater barriers of entry, um, you know, the, the consequences of debt and spending policies that are, you know, commonplace within Europe, just as they are in the United States, um, creating that generational angst there. Um, you're seeing concerns over the loss of national ethnicities, concerns over law and order um, and things like that, that is having a, an effect of pushing younger generations to the right. And we're seeing this again similarly play out in the United States. Um, you know, I'm not going to try to suggest that uh, you know, Generation Z, the Zoomers, are some sort of um, you know, massive right wing political movement ready to break out. But you know, what you do see is that it's, it's you know, those on – that, that identify as conservative or right-leaning or Republican or whatever label you want to use tend to be far more, you know, the, the, these are not, um, you know, George Bush Republicans by any means. So these are people that have um, viewpoints, you know, particularly when we think about uh, America's relationship with Israel in particular. Um, there's, these are big, big generational issues that break apart from, uh, you know, the, the political consensus, the bipartisan consensus on a lot of these things that opens up the door for, you know, a, a, you know, a number of political outcomes that would have been, you know, inconceivable and as a, as a large voting block, you know, not that long ago. And so, you know, I think this is just a very interesting now, again, as you mentioned, these are European parliaments. We have seen historically that uh, the swings within European representation do not always align with uh, domestic representation, right? You know, you always had, for example, a very strong UKIP presence within the UK when they are in the EU. This helped build up Brexit. This is where you had figures like Nigel Farage and Godfrey Bloom, um, you know, making these, these you know, very um, uh, uh, flamboyant, very, very strong, very bold speeches on the halls of the European Parliament without having a similar sort of traction with UKIP as a domestic party and the like. Um, and so that would be the interesting thing is how does the success how does that frustration with Brussels, how does the, the, that voting behavior when it comes to European representation play itself out in domestic politics? Um, you know, we have been seeing trends. You know, there has been uh, AFD, for example, in Germany, which is probably the you know, right-wing party that has faced the, the most restrictive, um, you know, that has, has you know, faced full, full, uh, you know, uh, full barrel assault from the political establishment, right? I mean, you, you have the, the judicial system there authorizes, you know, extra surveillance of this political party. I mean, you know, they, they, this is, this is much different. You know, it, it is, it is, you know, it, it is a, a very strong campaign. I mean, every single sector of uh, kind of German political society has been focused at AFD and yet they're still making gains um, in local elections. They made gains in the European elections. We'll see how it plays out in, in domestic elections there. Um, and we now have in the, the shadow of this European outcome and two very interesting domestic situations where, you know, one obviously is Macron calling for a snap election in a very, very short manner within France and um, the, the UK elections that will be going on on July 4th. And it's also creating interesting tensions between the establishment conservative party and the, uh, the, the upstart conservative uh, party in, in France, for example, you had um, the Republicans um, within France. You know, you, you had leadership talking about you know trying to do deals with National Front on creating sort of uh, electoral coalitions. You know, not running candidates in certain areas and things like that. That created that sparked a leadership crisis because you had the the, the, the entrenched powers that didn't want to deal. You know, that wanted to kind of to deperson um, Le Pen's party and the like. So you know, there, it's an interesting dynamic with how these you know, quote unquote center right parties are interacting with each other how voters are interested in pursuing out, you know, changing basically party affiliations that they've had for, for, for years now, for decades now. Um, and so it just shows just how quickly um, the, 
environment that we find ourselves in with again, causes that are widespread within the West. I mean, these are not uniquely European issues. You know, the, it's economy, war, migration. Um, you know, how these are sparking political changes that, again, are, are we're beyond the pale of uh, kind of acceptable political expectations not that long ago. And so this is something that I think has relevance even to an American audience, um, but obviously a, gives us a better understanding of, of geopolitics broadly. Yeah, it's remarkable how much the people in charge, the ruling class, uh, the ruling party of the last decade, really the last 20 years even, has just not even cared about the economic realities of people who are trying to make a living. Uh, I know that one of the big things in this election was that the Green Party or the, the Green Parties uh, within the European Parliament lost lost big, uh, was basically the headline. And uh, back down to about 50 seats, they had been up over 70 uh, in the last election. And what, what, what were people seeing that they were getting out of, out of the green agenda in Europe? It was, it was all bans and taxes and, and controls uh, on the sorts of things that make life livable and easier. Uh, so, of course, we know that the German government, with the support of Greens, has been shutting down nuclear power plants. Um, of course, the German government most likely in on the, the U.S.'s uh, sneaky tactics with the Ukrainians to uh, get rid of the uh, the Russian natural gas pipeline, which made power and gas cheaper in Germany. And so, gee, how can we make the cost of power and electricity go up and up and up? And apparently the, the, the Germans are working on a gas boiler ban. I mean, it's it's not, nothing dissuades these people from screwing you in terms of your cost of living. They just want to make everything more expensive. And I guess maybe if you're already retired and you're on a fixed income and uh, you just don't care. Uh, screw the young people. We're, we're, uh, we've got this ideological idea about uh, stopping global warming, which, of course, all of the if you've been paying any attention, uh, the ice caps are supposed to be gone by now. Everything was supposed to be boiling hot by now. Um, I, most people are just looking around and saying, you know what, I, the only thing that's obvious to me as a young person they're thinking is that my cost of living is really high and I can't afford a house and life is far, far more difficult than it needs to be. Why? Because the Greens keep making everything more expensive in the name of saving the world, but all they're doing is making life hard. And you can see how if you're just trying to get ahead in any way, that's, an, that's a conclusion you could easily come to. And so between the, the cost of power, between driving up the price of goods, and other, other goods and services because of ongoing trade wars that the U.S. is encouraging, sanctions, this all makes interest rates go up. It all makes life more expensive. And it's all part of this old guard, uh, this old uh, uh, alliances that have been running Europe for a long time and who have been telling us all the time that it's all these far right alternative parties that are the problem and they're threats to democracy. What you need to do is support democracy so that we can make uh, your standard of living go down. We can make the cost of living go up. We can cut off trade. We can destroy entrepreneurs and we can destroy the economy and also make you pay for millions and millions of new migrants who uh, are net uh, a net cost to the economy are not in any way net contributors or net producers uh, in terms of what's going on in this economy. So, yeah, just keep paying through the nose, young people. Just keep uh, uh, dealing with the rising cost of living. We've got everything under control, uh, just as long as we stick it to the Russians, just as long as uh, we, we show we're not racist by bringing in more migrants. This is just just a unfathomable uh, position if you're just trying to mind your own business and earn a living and raise a family. But for some reason, the ruling class doesn't care about that at all uh, in Europe, uh, as is apparent by the policies they're now supporting. Well, and that's the thing. So the ruling class hadn't really needed to be concerned about this stuff because material well-being, you know, while, while you know, 
hampered while less than otherwise would have been without you know the insane techno, you know, bureaucratic establishment and every all the buildup of the last several decades and you know all the bells and whistles of modern Europe. Material well-being was going up and up and up. And as long as you have an environment where people feel like they are getting richer, where they feel that they're getting better off, you're not going to radicalize non-ideologues. And and you know, this is of course goes into you know Murray Rothbard's you know poli political strategy writings in the '90s. Um, you know, touching on you know this kind of concept of uh, middle of, of a, a radical middle America trying to you know touch um, you know touch that that demographic that you know otherwise is not political by nature, but can be sparked into political change when they recognize that they are the ones uh, getting ripped off, and that coalition you know that you know, it, but it, it takes that jump because again these these are people that are not. You know, they're, they are, are not professional activists. They are not, um, you know, political crusaders the same way that, you know, the Green Party has been, the same way that kind of left-leaning, utopian, you know, political, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the nature that benefits the political left, this, this higher calling is their political ideology, is very, very different than, you know, what motivates and mobilizes and can spark Kind of that that middle class into a size enough sizable enough you know political focus to actually change things. Of course, you know, lo looking back, you know, liberty, you know, liberal revolutions, liberal in a better term, have always been, uh, you know, almost always been the product of, kind of, you know, the the, the landed non noble class. It's been merchants. It's been people that were not the benefactors of fiat government privilege, nor were they the the, the poor that depended upon free bread, they, they wore those people that had property in their own level of sovereignty standing up and getting sick and tired of a political status quo that made them take care of those below them and were preventing them from having the opportunities from those at high. And I think that really is the sentiment. It's that anger that this, you know, you know, inflation playing a, a major, major role in this, then the massive cultural change that nobody has voted for. Right, and if you look at uh, the the you know this and and what's fascinating right now is gonna I think there's the, the, one of the most interesting political developments is what is going to, on in the UK, because again from an American audience you know it, it you know it, it the reason why this is important is that the, the Tory party is you know the, what the oldest political party uh, in in the world um, you know this is this is a very very old uh, uh, resilient political party that has completely lost its entire legitimacy in the eyes of the people that give them power, the people that vote them. And this is not that far removed, right? It was 20, uh, 2019, right, where, where Boris Johnson led the largest uh, uh, conservative majority in you know, quite some time. If, you know, if, you know, it was a massive landslide. Um, you know, off of Brexit, off of some of the extremes of the left wing parties diving into, you know, all sorts of, you know, ridiculous, you know, you know, put your laundry list of absurd, you know, uh, the left wing causes there. Um, you know, it was a really able to galvanize that kind of working class British environment, just, you know, not ideologically driven, but just wanting competency. And they've completely squandered all of it. And part of that is that you, you look at these manifestos of these political parties in the UK and thing, or UK things like that. You know, it's been promising. Oh, we're going to cut back migration. Oh, we're going to improve this, that, and the other. We're going to cut taxes. We're going to, you know, we're going to address all these things. They've done none of it. They've done none of it. And so, once you have that complete breakdown of trust and legitimacy, then it allows someone like an Nigel Farage coming in from the outside and saying, "Look, these liars have been taking advantage of you for for years." Where you know the the the, the Tory Party right now. Um, you know, there's 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 a, a mounting campaign right for zero seats to completely obliterate it. Now that might be a little too ambitious, based you know you know they they might get a few people there, but we are now seeing right now po political polling with N Nigel Farage entering this race. You know, only a few weeks ago. I mean, this is not some sort of long build up movement, right? Farage was perfectly content, you know, with being a, a cable news commentator um, and and traveling to the, U the United States and hanging out at Trump rallies, right? I mean, he was not someone who has been carefully building up a political apparatus post-Brexit, uh, post right? You know, they, they had the whole uh, kind of flirtation with the Reform Party um, back during that, the, that, that previous election and nothing kind of came for it. You know, this, he, Farage came back off the sidelines and in just a matter of a couple of weeks um, has now built a political party that in some polls now is beating 
the Tory party outright and kind of twisting the underlying logic, right? You know, the, the status, the, uh, the, 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 the great weapon of um, establishment do nothingism. It's like, oh, if you don't vote for us, those bad guys are going to win, right? And so once you get to that point, once you get to that breaking point where the reform party is the stronger party, then that entire narrative goes out the window where it's no longer, um, you know, vote for reform as a vote for labor. It is now a vote for the Tories as a vote for labor. And once, and again, it's incredible how quickly this can happen. Again, a big part of this is a, again, this, this massive generational swing because it's remarkable watching this Tory party operate and the complete hatred. I mean, the, the, the vitriol they have for young Britons is, is absolutely fascinating. Everything from, um, you know, again, the prioritize, prioritization of the economic well-being of pensioners over the well-being of new workers um, calls for um, a mandated public service and the like. I mean, just the, the lack of a, a, a message that is entirely placing a greater and greater burden on younger generations at the, uh, uh, to try to, to bribe away, um, you know, this, this older block that, you know, in many ways are the ones that are the most experienced at the fall at the, the, the lies of this party has really opened the door to a lot of, uh, a lot of energy, a lot of, of different dynamics there. And I think this this generational divide is fast. I mean, what, one one very interesting example going back to the European the European elections at large is that in um, in Cyprus um, there was a, uh, a YouTuber who uh, was like an independent, had no party of his own, but a, a YouTuber was elected um, just based off the popularity of YouTube's YouTube videos, right? So like you, you're seeing this very interesting generational divide translate itself into political power and. But this is the product. This is the byproduct of a financial system uh, that has, uh, again, the people that are the, made the worst off are these younger, younger voters, and it's you know, they are not simply following uh, 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 you know, the 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 ideological products of the Green Party. I mean, there there is a, a willingness to think outside, um, and that creates a, a very interesting dynamic there. And, and so you, you now have, again, I think this very interesting generational divide, which can, if you understand, again, the extent to which the entire economic machine, um, you know, just how dangerous it is from that, that generational dynamic, um, the, the, that is, again, I think one of the most fascinating aspects of the modern political system. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a good point you made a few minutes ago too. Is the whole issue of well, they had just haven't had to worry about the economic situation, so they could go down all sorts of uh, strange paths uh, that whatever the the ruling class wanted in terms of migration or sticking it to the Russians, and it and it didn't really have an effect on the ability to earn a living, if le at least not one that was discernible, right? It was still your standard of living was still going up. It would have gone up a lot more had had these countries embraced far more free markets, lower taxes, more freedom, there all there would have been, that was, that's of course always true in the United States too, people would be far better off uh, without all of the government controls, without the underlying inflation of the monetary uh, supply. But as long as it continues to go up, people don't notice that they're really getting cheated by they're really getting ripped off. It's only when it starts to really stagnate and go down that people realize that they're being ripped off. And it's, it's been the same in Europe as in the United States, right? We've been in a multi-decade period of declining interest rates, a period where thanks to uh, a lot of gains in terms of productivity, thanks to the benefits of international trade, the the regimes of Europe have been able to tighten the screws on the economic system over and over and over again, but people were able, still able to experience some economic gains. But that seems to be over now. And it's the same it, there's in the United States, where now constantly clamping down on economic freedom actually leads to a noticeable decline in the standard of living, or at least a situation where your increases are so tiny that you're just wondering, why am I even spinning my wheels like this? Uh, something's deeply wrong with the status quo, and people are now starting to see that. So it's been, as long as interest rates were really low, you could always just say, oh yeah, we're gonna jack up the price of automobiles, or we're gonna jack up the price of appliances, but that's okay, you could just finance it. Uh, you could just pay it off a little bit, uh, bit by bit, but 
that is becoming now prohibitively expensive for many people. This is more of a story in the U.S. where there's more freedom in interest rates. The Europeans continue to ram down interest rates, but that's leading to more and more monetary inflation, as, as noted by Daniel Lacaye in numerous articles here at Mises.org. So the, the free ride in terms of uh, economic gains, which wasn't really free, we're now paying for it, but the seemingly free ride that's occurred over the last 40 years, uh, it's, it's not paying off as much as it was. And so, yeah, that game that you noted, uh, it's, it's unclear how much longer it continued to work. When, and the game is, is, is even more um, sinister with some of the stuff they are not even hiding. So you had, uh, there was a very interesting article in Politico Europe um, this week um, talking about how the uh, the EU is w- would is expected to finally fine France if it has a far right government, because the EU has been letting France off for spending more than the rules are you know, than they're supposed to be spending. Right, You're breaking the um, some of the expectations that they have of EU nations. And this goes on with center party politics for, for quite some time, but it's okay because they're friends, right? You know, they're all part of the same club. But you have an outsider. You have the potential of an outsider coming in. You have, the, you, have the, you have political change. And all of a sudden, these rules that do not apply when these national governments are you know, part of their inside club now come to apply when you have an outsider in there. And so for all this talk about you know, how, how the EU is, a, is an indispensable part of a rules-based international order and how you know, we, we have to stand up and fight Putin because we have to protect democracy, here you, you, know, you, you have the full mask-dropping moment of these, these Euro-technocrats, these centralists, these, these, uh, you know, these, 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 these you know, parasites in Brussels that, that have this entire game played, where again, if, you, if, if, if a country dare you know, is, is, is uppity and, and checks, you know, votes outside of the predetermined lines of acceptable opinion, then now they can come in and, and, and go after them, right? They, they will punish, um, you know, they, they will punish the voters with these tools if they do so. We saw kind of a similar situation come up with the way that the Bank of England, um, you know, dealt with some of their policies with the Liz Trust era that led to her very quick um, collapse. Again, I'm not trying to Come up here and say the list trust was some sort of you know heroic figure um, that would have made you know UK great again or anything like that. But but there was a rebellion amongst the technocratic class to the policies that she had had voiced, and that helped spark you know, the, the the shortest tenure of a prime minister in UK history. Brought in um, you know the change there, um, and so again you you have these these technocrats utilizing these these le- leviathans of you know, regulation and these tools that they've been given that are willing to, to come down and use hard power against these countries that they're step out of lines. I mean, you're seeing similar situations with the way the EU treats Hungary over their rejection of you know, migration policies that have been normalized elsewhere and the like. So again, it, it, it demonstrates just how hostile to democracy, how, how hostile they are to any sort of serious notion of political self-determination within the current European pro- uh, project. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you for listening. And I just want to note that next week the episode will be late because we're going to wait until the presidential debate happens. And then we'll talk about that at the next episode. I'm sure that'll offer plenty to make fun of. Yeah, I'm looking for an in-depth discussion of the very serious policy proposals we're going to get uh, in this contrast there. There's not going to be any superficial fluff at all. Very, very, very smart and well-informed men will be discussing important policies next week. And so we'll be sure to go into some of the details on that. You'll be sure and listen in, and we'll see you next time.